journalism is under attack like never before. Oh, no, husband's being tear gas fired. You have to have the facts. Beautiful, but tragic. Because people are doubting everything. You're the only way of telling their story. How would you describe this outbreak? Something like an apocalypse. You're going to be really tired. You're going to be really scared. It's too dangerous, you know. Anyone who says they're not scared is lying. Anything can happen. Did you get hit? I sometimes wonder how have we managed to get out of this? People being killed. We do genuinely believe in what we do. He's clearly marked as press. To show the truth. Wow, this is absolutely unbelievable. To uncover an injustice. This is the result of ethnic cleansing. I don't think any journalist wants anything more than that. I'm Alex Crawford. I'm Stuart Ramsey. And this is Hotspots. Coming up on Hotspots, please keep your opinion. We're in Afghanistan as coalition forces prepare to withdraw. And the Afghan National Army has got a very big problem. We witness the sudden and shocking collapse as the Taliban take over. I think it's a procession of the Taliban. They're coming down the street uh, just next to us. And I return to report on the reality of the new regime. What a horrible, horrible place. Hey, there's no need for this. Until I get you film again, I will break everything. Soldiers try to manoeuvre through ditches and across fields. There's a Taliban stronghold in a compound hidden by a tree line just 100 metres away. I actually got to Pakistan on 9-11, and I've been covering Afghanistan for all of the 20 years. Oh, gosh. I don't know how many times I've been there. I've been to Afghanistan a lot. Our route takes us east to a place where the Afghan government has no remit, where foreign troops steer well clear. I've been told to put on my burqas that I'm less noticeable. Alex and I did a lot of stories that involved actually interviewing and meeting the Taliban in Afghanistan. Well, there's a helicopter uh, above us now, and uh, immediately as it arrived, uh, the Taliban said that that was the end of the programme, that they had to leave. They've shown us how uh, they plant their improvised bombs. This is what they want the foreigners to see, though. They want to show that they are a fighting force and they're too tough to be taken on. It's sort of been a part of my, almost my entire adult working life, actually. I, I was looking forward to going back because I knew that it was bubbling up to be a, a big, big story. Did we think Kabul was going to fall at that stage? No. Did we think things were going to change dramatically within Afghanistan? 100%. I knew it was coming, something big was coming. Because I haven't got a good track record here. <laughs> <You> came back. <laughs> yeah, One of the last times I went to Afghanistan, I was um, held hostage with my crew for um, most of the day and had to be rescued by the American military. So going back was quite a big deal. You're always going to be a bit nervous going to somewhere like Afghanistan. The real the reason why we we're going back was because the American forces were pulling out and this was opening up a vacuum of power and the Taliban were moving into that vacuum. The obvious big aim of this trip was to get Alex and Kev with the Taliban. You don't know what you're going to find on the ground, how dangerous things are. You get there and you realise it's a thriving, thriving, bustling city. I forgot what the traffic's like in Kabul. You soon get used to the, the extra checkpoints, the concrete blast barriers, and that just all sort of fades away, and it just looks like a normal city, but you have to keep reminding yourself it's not. One of the biggest parts of this story was the reality for everyday Afghans, and particularly young Afghans. They've you know, increasingly become used to getting more and more rights, more and more freedoms. Smells great. <laughs> <laughs> so we make all the meals here. 
Ah. No, no. Uh, I manage uh, here and uh, my mom and my sister right. cooking here. That cafe that we walked into, you could have found anywhere in Europe, you know, filled with young people of uh, different ages and different sexes and run by a, a woman. It was pretty unheard of in the Taliban time. And quite by chance, I just went up to these two young women. What did you hope your future would be? And now, what are you thinking if the Taliban come back? Um, of course, we all hope that uh, our future must be so good. But now, we don't think that we have, uh, we will have these uh, opportunities and all of this. It is so tough for us. Would you go? Or do you feel you need to stay here and you're the future? You, you guys I, are I the know, future. I know I'm the future, but the uh, situation is so bad in here. We just are alive. We're just alive, not living. Just keep going and don't, don't know what, will, what uh, will be our future. So uh, if I have opportunity, I will live here, but will come back to you. There's a whole generation of Afghan women, you know, 20 year olds who've grown up with these freedoms and now we're facing the prospect of having all these newly won freedoms being stripped away again by a new Taliban regime. The next bits we needed were things that were a bit outside of our control. You know, we needed the Taliban to say yes for us to go there, and everything was delaying and delaying and delaying and delaying. How are you feeling, Trophy? Good. Really glad it's happening, finally happening. I'm worried for the Taliban, though. <laughs> <laughs> How are you feeling? Uh, yeah. 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 Right, yeah. <laughs> Sky was very worried about us being kidnapped, us being killed, us never coming back, us getting shot at in crossfire. What's your name? Sorry? My name is Kevin. Kevin. Kevin, I don't want to show my face, OK? Yeah, I know. No. We'd only been traveling maybe half an hour, 45 minutes, and we were forced to stop because there was a gunfight going on on the road in front of us. There's some shooting ahead. Before we stop from the road. It's 50 cal. That's close, they're just coming by. It said, keep your camera. Please keep your camera. It was a bit of drama at the beginning of the trip. We got past that and we're on our way. We passed the last government checkpoint. So we're now into the Taliban territory. And eventually met up with the Taliban. Just the, there were some to control this product. The yes, that's people. right. So, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you for having us. There, there were a few polite niceties at the start. We just get on with filming everything that moves. Did they have a fight here or did the army leave? going onto that huge base, which used to be held by the Afghan National Army and once had the Americans on, and seeing it completely empty and taken over by all these Taliban fighters. If they're able to take this base with all the weapons and all the military vehicles that they had here, then the Afghan National Army has got a very big problem them taking us through lockup after lockup after lockup, showing how they got all this weaponry. Oh, right. Lots of bullets to store. RPG. RPG. Lots of weapons. They're all brand new. What's going to happen to all of this? <laughs> I say when we needed other battles, we'll take it if not to here. That was pretty shocking. That was pretty shocking. Doesn't bode well for the immediate future and certainly doesn't shout out peace to me. Is it all right to sit there? So we've been told that um, we've got five minutes to take pictures and then we we'll have to leave. We have to go back to the woman, I guess. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah. Can I go lunch there? Okay. 
What's he saying, Hamid? Okay, okay. so we're uh, being told that we have to go to where the women are now. A large number of the men in the group didn't want to be eating with a woman. You can't, on the one hand, say that you've really changed and you've progressed and you're very accepting of women and, you know, we want women journalists, come, we'll look after you, and then exclude them <laughs> from meal times. It's a surreal thing, having a chit-chat with the Taliban under some fruit trees in a sunny garden in the middle of nowhere in rural Afghanistan. Why fighting? We're sitting with all these armed guys and the younger ones are much happier to talk to me. I think it only works because I'm a foreign journalist. The older ones, they're, they're very uncomfortable with the whole idea of talking to a woman who isn't a relative. It was good to get back to Kabul. Hello. Welcome back, Kabul again. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. You were brilliant. One of the most famous sayings from the start of this whole two decade long conflict was, you know, various Taliban commanders saying, You've got the watches, but we've got the time. You know, we will just sit this out. We might not win this now, but that was what they were saying back then you know, 20 years ago, we'll, we'll be back. After two decades of conflict costing trillions of pounds and thousands of deaths, NATO forces are slipping quietly out of Afghanistan. The Prime Minister is holding a meeting of the COBRA Emergency Committee following the Taliban's rapid advances in Afghanistan. The truth is, this did unfold more quickly than we had anticipated. Afghanistan is spinning out of control. Stuart had said to me, Dominique, I just have a feeling that we need to go to Afghanistan. So he wrote an email to our bosses saying, I really feel we need to be there. I really feel like this could be another Saigon. I guess on the one hand, you really want to go because you know that this is going to be a huge thing, don't you? So um, I don't actually tell most of my friends that well, I'm going to go and do these things. Um, people who need to know, need to know. So my wife, obviously my parents, you know, you promise to be careful, um, but I don't think, I don't think that really does much good. I'm trying to work out how many times, when, when I was last here. <laughs> it's five years ago. It seems quite quiet. <laughs> I mean, as in not awfully busy. Yeah. Obviously, with Kabul, I know it incredibly well, so it's it's not a strange environment for me to be in. What time is it? It's 7.30. 7.30, OK. The travel is pretty much overnight, so you always arrive absolutely exhausted. But we knew we had to try and get something on air as, as quickly as possible. One of our producers there said there's a park here in the center of town and actually you can see the impact of the Taliban's advances because of all the refugees and internally displaced people who are living in this park. There are thousands. Everyone in that park is on edge. They're traumatized. And actually when you stop and look around, it's not a secure environment. And that's, I think, when we started to realize that the advance wasn't just something we'd sort of read on paper and wondered if it was actually happening, but we were seeing the actual result. The real impression you get here is that people feel that Kabul is being surrounded or it's certainly going to be in the coming weeks. And of course, the situation's going to get worse. Food prices are already going up. Petrol prices have gone up as well, and there'll be more displaced people arriving here. And there seems nothing at this stage obvious at least, that's going to see the Taliban stopped in their tracks. Recently, life has become difficult for people. People worried about the, how, the, the way Taliban treat us before and now, it's a little different. Why should Afghan people go back to the dark era? Why today I'm, I'm you know, people like me and thousand other people are forced to leave this country? Do you think that that guy who is selling fruits, he can leave this country? No. 
There was definitely a an anxiety about what could be coming, how are things going to go in the next days. But in people's minds, we were talking days or weeks or months. You know, it became apparent to us that the American and British visas being issued to translators, people who worked with all Western militaries, was not going to be processed anything like quickly enough to allow these people to leave. So what you saw happening in Kabul were like these pop-up services at internet cafes around the city where people who couldn't access computers at their homes could go to the internet cafes and get some assistance filling out their paperwork. They were extremely tense and very, very scared. It is our turn to be helped. We help them, you know, we save their lives. We were the people who communicate with two cultures. We are, otherwise, without interpreters, they did nothing. And so, so, so now you're abandoned and scared? Yes. One of the Afghan local guys who works with us said he knew a spot where you can get up out of town, you can look down over to, over to the airport and get a look on what they're doing. The Taliban have now taken Logar province. Its borders are only about 37 miles down the road behind me, and it feels inevitable now that Kabul will fall. The city is very much divided between those who can leave, or at least hope they can leave, and those who know they can't. It means this place is very tense now. You know, the US had started flying in a few extra resources and, and the Brits, and we'd filmed those planes and choppers arriving at the airport. But still, I think, Everyone, including us, we're in a little bit of denial about how fast it might be happening. We were already getting word that the Taliban were very near, but the next day they did actually come into town. London, it's Stuart, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. We're still going, Toby. I'm rolling in the camera as well. Okay. It was a moment that many people, including myself, feared because we just didn't know what it was going to be like. I think it's a procession of, uh, of the Taliban. Uh, yes, it is. There's the white flag. And uh, they're coming down uh, the street uh, just next to us. That's the point when the city basically started to fall apart. It's like the announcement of the end game, and it, everything changed at that moment. We went into just total rolling coverage about a city that had just 24 hours been pretty normal to a city that was suddenly being taken over. Then there was a, a big security kerfuffle. I know the airport road is busy, and, but, but is there no chance that it's going to clear? Yeah. No, there's CBS, Al Jazeera, us. No. Uh, there's, there's like going to be about 10 cars pulling no, out no, of that's here. Too, okay, it's we'll too just, many. We'll just go for ourselves. I just think like a convoy, oh my God, it just says foreigner, important people, attack. I was really concerned, I was in danger, yeah. And you go through all of these um, concerns about like, what do you do? By this stage, Kabul is completely surrounded. So there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a bit of panic. But in that scenario, I like to think that just talking as a team, you're immediately able to bring down the anxiety levels. After the arrival of the Taliban, there's now much discussion uh, as to where is the best place to stay. We're right downtown near the presidential palace. Obviously quite a long way from the airport. The airport has the security of the American and more particularly the British uh, troops that are there, which is where they're doing the relief operation. Nobody's sure what to do because we do know that the road to the airport is absolutely rammed, so there's a lot of discussion. We decided to go with the idea that we'll pull back to the airport, we'll assess the situation, but the, the, the thinking was that you should move now before the Taliban have organised and had time to block off the route to the airport. And so we open up the gates and there's the Taliban standing right in front of us and walking across the road. I think that drive to the airport had the potential to be the most dangerous thing we did on the entire trip. You're in a window where no one's in control. We just floored it. Not taking risks with any building, but also we're not going to stop. Okay, so this is chaos at the airport. Is that the airport? 
Well, that's one hell of a queue to get up to the airport down this road. How far to the Baron? Uh, just there is Baron. OK. Can... OK, well, let's give it a, let's give it a couple of minutes. Sorry, two long more walking. Right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. We made it safely into the Baron Hotel. We did not know the British military had pinpointed that hotel as their evacuation point. The airport is just over this side, and the road that runs along it up to the civilian section of the uh, airport is all controlled by the Taliban. What's important about this place is where the British nationals and Afghans who are allowed to come to the United Kingdom are based. It's from here that they're moved to those flights that take them out of Afghanistan. We start getting these pictures of the people around this huge uh, transporter plane, desperately trying to get through, holding on, and then one or two people falling off the plane after it's taken off. And then, I mean, this was like, oh my goodness me, this really is just utterly horrendous. Those terribly heartbreaking and distressing imagery of the American plane with lots of people hanging onto it and running alongside it on the runway. What we didn't know was actually about to get worse. And we get up the next morning and it's turned into a British military forward operating base. And just there, I could have reached through the wire and touched him. It's a guy from the Taliban. This has been absolutely chaotic for days and days in a row, and now the Taliban have come in, and uh, they are effectively arranging crowd control for the Brits, and they're literally right next to the soldiers. I think quite a lot of them can't quite believe what they're seeing. Uh, Taliban openly walking around with machine guns, controlling the crowds. I think for the British forces trying to get people out of here, this is quite a remarkable experience, to be honest. You know, a lot of those people trying to leave spoke English. Many of them had worked for the British government or the military or companies and were saying, you know, help, help, help. One of the morning, Stuart pulled me aside and he said, I'm going to be honest with you, this is really depressing me, Dominique. I'm waking up every morning to dozens and dozens of emails from people saying, help me, help me, and what are we supposed to do? Hey, what's up? Okay. Alex had interviewed Mawa in July. She's a young women's rights activist, and her life was in danger once the Taliban took over. Of course, we all hope that uh, our future must be so good. When she appealed for help, I don't think there was anyone in our um, team who thought twice about that. The problem was practically <laughs> trying to get her to a place of safety. So I then thought the only people who could possibly help them would be the team on the ground. So I sent her a picture of Stuart. We spoke to the British soldiers about it and, you know, helped identify them in the crowd and managed to get them through the crowd safely. It's OK, they're going to bring them all. Come, come. Just, just, just. Remember, the soldiers are sort of one by one bringing each family member out and Ma was saying it's that one or it's that one. And we were able to get them out and, and through. But for every one good one like that, there's dozens and dozens where we just simply fail. By the end, we've probably spent more of our time helping people than we did filming. It seems to go in ebbs and flows, though. Right? Sometimes you have it like absolutely rammed with people pushing and chaos outside. Other times it sort of calms down. What happens? You know, sometimes we can manage to calm the crowd down using the local nationals to calm them down. When they see the process is working, they're calm. When they start getting a bit hot, uh, dehydrated or whatever, people start getting annoyed. Uh, we tend to find a lot of the people causing the uh, causing the disturbances haven't got the correct documentation, so right. they sort of know their chance in their arms, so, and that's how that one And I suppose, goes. really, this is all about time, isn't it? You've just got to crack on. Well, that's it. I'm not I mean, going to be here forever. It could be days. Who knows? Okay. Boris said the 30th. Every day, we stepped out into that, that outdoor bit of the compound. It was like a different film set. Hi, Lars. How are you? Yeah, good, you? Good. How's it going, then? Yeah. Get up, give me one! 
Yeah. Yeah. Dad, wait for me. Can I come up with you? Uh, if you're in the same location every day, you want to be able to make it look different, keep it interesting for the viewer, to keep them engaged visually so that they listen to the, the words and the story. What's Toby doing? Toby's gone up with Sergeant Major. See the cues. I think it's pretty damn chaotic out there. That's the first time I really got to see what was over the wall. And um, it just stops you in your tracks. Stay there! Stay there! There's thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the worst possible situation. They've run for their lives. I don't know how many of those people ever got through. The cargo containers were absolutely correct because they, they limited the people, but the effect was like being in sort of Hillsborough. Every day people came, they got more and more frustrated because they were waiting longer and longer. They had nothing to eat, they had nothing to drink. It's over 40 degrees Celsius, it's very, very hot. The problem now is not trying to control the crowds per se, it's the fact that at the front people are just getting crushed. So thousands of Afghans who are coming who have no right to come here but they're coming anyway and they, they can't just leave them to get crushed in, and the heat is terrible and there's lots of children. So they have to have a sort of secondary barrier where people who may have never get in properly are at least safe for the time being. It's, uh, it just seems to go for better worse here and, uh, and there's, I, I don't know almost speechless as to what they're going to do about it. You're a human being on the one hand, and you want to show respect and show decency. But on the other hand, I mean, there's, there's hardly anybody reporting from what's happening at this stage. Washington, that day, there's a briefing at the State Department where they describe what was happening at the airport's congestion. And I went out determined to make sure they couldn't lie like that about what was happening at the airport. There are pictures from this that we didn't even put on air, soldiers giving CPR to people on the ground, people, you know, dying right there all around us. It was pretty difficult for all of us, I think, because, yeah, we were very tired by this stage. It's a time difference thing as well, but also we were just but by definition of what we're doing, we're working really, really long hours. I'm not really sure what our governments expected would happen when you put a, thousands of people together in one place, try and pen them in and not really know what to do with them. There's a phrase used called dog and pony, and it's when you are basically given a facility by the people you're working with and they want to go and show you what they're doing. Um, and it's... You know, it's essentially a PR exercise. Up here, we're going Washington. to get uh, a search dog to come out and just do a quick search of there. You will then get your bags back, OK? This isn't about getting masses of people, herding them together and getting them onto planes. Everything is about making sure we remember that these are our friends. They're people that have worked with us for years and we treat them in that way. <laughs> Stuart and Toby followed a group of evacuees making their way to Britain and followed their journey from leaving the compound we were staying at. We went onto the plane with them and um, it was the first time we'd seen the process take place. We knew what was happening, but we had nobody had actually seen it before. Well, this is it. This is where people make that final flight out of Afghanistan to countries all over the world. Some of the people here have had a hell of a journey. They've been queuing, queuing for days, but they made it. This is their, their way home. You see these people, they've just got a small piece of hand luggage. Their entire life has been left behind. And they're from the very old to tiny babies. I saw newborns being put on these planes, going into they don't know what. 99.9% .9 of these people probably never even left Afghanistan. They've certainly not been to the UK or America. What happens to them? And they're the lucky ones. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end and they're really, really desperate. I mean, they're in a 
the sewage canal. They're trying to show their paperwork, trying to show that they perhaps should be looked at. It's really desperate. That is actually the sort of pretty much hopeless column, we're told, but I can see all sorts of passports from different countries. The fact is that when the withdrawal happens, it's always going to be difficult because they can't keep working. The soldiers can't keep working up until the last minute. They have to start withdrawing in the days leading up to their departure. How are they going to deal with these people when that happens? We just don't know. I mean, I understood the reason they did it, but seeing like tiny babies in that, when you know, when you think about how we treat tiny babies here, it's inconceivable. The scenes in that sewage canal were just so desperate because there was just something about that picture of people standing literally knee deep in sewage, and it really, really, really smelled. Because there's a lot of problems. No, no, you have to they hold up pictures of flags of countries, just basically trying to get the attention to say, this is the nation we're looking for, and they would try and direct soldiers. But that was the, the desperation. You can imagine, you have spent hours, sometimes days, in these really horrendous conditions, wearing the same clothes, wearing the same shoes, having had li very little sleep, and now you're about to get evacuated out of the country. The sewage canal in those pictures, to me, they tell the story about how messy everything was. Yeah, we'll go to the American section, we're going to, not to the Brits. So you got to go into the... Right to the main terminal. Yeah. I think what bothers me is that that order to leave didn't come from the soldiers on the ground at Kabul. That was really bad. We knew it was coming. Oh, we're so bloody angry. It feels terrible. I mean, look how many people are still here. And they're all in the sewage canal. Thousands. It's heartbreaking. Even if the deadline is the 31st of August, the military have to start packing up beforehand. Uh, the paratroop regiment has told us that we had to leave our location because as soon as they finish processing, we're not exactly sure when that's going to be, but it's clearly soon, they need to start the process of withdrawing because it has to be done assuming they could be attacked. So it's, it's a dangerous period for them and they've asked us to, uh, to leave. And so the question, I suppose, is just how many people will they be able to get processed and take with them? That did not sit well with any of us. Uh... That did not sit well with any of us at all. So we're, uh, we're finally on the plane. I mean, everyone's still standing. And it is, I mean, it's absolutely full. I can't believe my eyes. It's huge, but there's over 400 people in here. The big, um, you know, doors started to come up. Once the doors were up, he said, OK, everybody, now you can all sit down. I did feel like we'd failed because we'd left. I didn't want to go. None of us did. Is it right to leave? I don't know. To be honest, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Is it? Oh. And then the bomb went off. Martin called the head of security at the Baron Hotel. And he said there's been a suicide bomb attack. What haunts me now is the people I talked to in the canal. Because I think, you know, it was very soon after we left. And I'm, they must, some of them, the guys that I spoke to, they must be dead. Um, in the most awful way. They were having the worst possible time and then murdered. I couldn't have gone any higher trying to stay, but one of us would have been outside when that bomb went off. For certain. So it was right.
the situation in Afghanistan has uh, deteriorated. No one wanted our, our engagement and our presence in Afghanistan to end uh, in the way that it did. Like many veterans, this last week has been one that has seen me struggle through anger and grief and rage. This is all the makings of a strategic disaster. Did I or others think that the Taliban would take over quite so fast? Absolutely not. <laughs> I think even the Taliban, to be honest, were pretty shocked. Wheels up. Let's do it. Let's do it. And this is just a start, actually. We, we, we can't smile until we cross the border. How far to the border, Alex? Being told varying distances. Getting in this time was complicated and interesting. The decision was made to jump on a plane to Pakistan and we would try to go via the Khyber Pass. You, you knew then, going that way, you were embarking on a proper adventure. What? What's your thought on coming through the Khyber Oh, man, this is cool. Very cool. I mean, it's this stuff a legend. I've always wanted to see it. It's brilliant. It's an incredibly historic route. It's absolutely dramatically beautiful. It doesn't matter how many times you do it, it's still breathtakingly gorgeous. Plus, you realize you're treading the same path that's been the center of history and trade routes and fighting. We've just crossed over the border from Pakistan, and the first thing you see is the white Taliban flag. Lots of people here waiting. Um, no one seems terribly happy, um, but we're told we can film. And they're still so unsure about how to operate this border. They still haven't got a, a stamp, a passport stamp, saying that we've officially arrived. Is this, is this a new weapon? I have no idea. It's new. Where did you get it from? From the Americans? The Americans. Oh, Americans. It's from the Americans, yeah. I mean, that whole day, that whole drive, you know, leaving Islamabad in the morning, getting to Kabul at night, I mean, it was good. It was a good 15-hour drive. I'm interested to see what it's going to be like. I'm very keen to see how, how they're going to be and how um, amenable they're going to be to filming and everything. We've heard some sort of quite nasty reports about how they've treated some of the local journalists, but no one's had any direct experience of it from amongst the foreign correspondents. The reason we went to the embassies was because we were waking up in a new Kabul. At that point in time, we were thinking, okay, well, what has happened to these embassies? You know, we know they've all been evacuated and people have left. These guys were being friendly towards us and they were being welcoming, but as soon as I turned around to Alex, she said, um, I've just become invisible. And I suddenly looked around and she was absolutely right. None of them would engage her in eye contact. None of them would speak to her. She, she basically did not exist. It's probably one of the most frustrating, infuriating, irritating and insulting ways of being treated when someone thinks you're so, I don't know whether it's unimportant, uninteresting, irrelevant, because that's all the messages that they're giving when they're not looking you in, in your eye. So they can come back today, tomorrow, next week, whenever they want. No, inshallah, the Mung Masilino, Agam Dakade, Cheda Halko Sarakara, with Jurkio, the Saparatuna to be other Halaguapash. They want to show us how they've destroyed alcohol in the um, Canadian embassy, so we'll see what they've done there. Hmm. What's your view about so much alcohol here? بس نو خو البته د دو دا اقتصادي وضع چې برابر یو نور خو خوراکونه کوي به دې ته ضرورت کیږي بیا څنګه خو نشیم لري او څه نور 
For them, in case no share no more salad. It was a bit weird, sort of walking through these places that have been, you know, the thriving heart of Kabul diplomacy for so long, and now they're empty, eerie, and just sort of Taliban walking around and showing us whatever they want to show us. Yeah, this is usually just complete chaos. Uh, cars everywhere, with cars honking, people running into each other, and now it's completely empty. And the US Embassy, obviously, you know, with the Islamic Emirates flag, painted in massive letters in front of it. It's, yeah, it's crazy. We were talking to some guys around there, and then some of them were getting ready to go on a patrol. So we asked, could we go on a patrol with them? And the guy said, OK, we'll take you on a little patrol. You know, Alex is Alex, and she didn't really wait. Well, I, I first climb into the back of the pickup truck, and then Alex hops in after me. We suddenly realised they were utterly mortified at this strange woman climbing into the back of their of their vehicle. There's one on it. They're a bit scared of a woman. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah, they're very uncomfortable because they. They're not meant to associate with a woman who's not a relative, and as soon as I got in, they all got out. They don't even want to look at me. These guys had no idea. They'd probably never been that close to a woman in their lives, let alone a Western woman. You know, I have to say, I thought it was pretty funny. Alex less so. All we want to do is sit and take some pictures of you doing the patrol. It's like, come on. Yeah, it was immensely frustrating. The Taliban want to show that they're in control. They're desperate for the recognition know, from the international community. Before we arrived in Kabul, there'd been these growing uh, women's marches, sort of small protests with women very, very bravely walking through the streets of Kabul. Hi, good to meet you, Zachary. Thank, Thank you, you for much. sparing the time to talk to us. Thank the you. journalists have been covering women protesting for their rights and they'd been picked up and then basically tortured for hours and hours. They were beaten until they went unconscious and then they were brought back round and then beaten again. Did you think at any stage um, that you might die? I had to move the truck, I had to move the truck. And I was waiting for a few days before the day, because the Taliban had no need. My overwhelming emotion when I saw them was how incredibly brave they were because they, they were brave by speaking to a foreign crew because they knew that they were once again exposing themselves to the possibility of being picked up again as soon as the Taliban saw this report and they were determined to do it. I mean, when you're standing there and you're looking at two people who have been beaten to that point for doing what essentially is my job, it makes you realise not only what you do, but also how lucky you are. It's uh, about an hour, an hour and a half drive to get up to, uh, to Bagram, to the airbase. And we just did what you usually do. You go and knock on the door. I'd been to Bagram years ago in the early 2000s, and I think anybody who's reported from Afghanistan knows about Bagram. It's a massive base, formerly Soviet base and then later a US base. So we're finally in this huge base. Bingo. When we got into Bagram, which was a miracle in itself, then you're thinking, okay, well, where do we go? This place is 30 square miles of base, and everywhere there's a story. The main one being the detention center. How do we find it? There are containers filled with stuff. This is a portfolio stuffed full of Afghans who worked for the coalition forces, including their ID numbers. We were then went further in and further in and further in, and we suddenly saw what was quite obviously outside of a prison with big high towers to overlook 
the, the courtyard, lots of barbed wire, lots of, suddenly it felt you were wandering into a detention centre. I can't believe anyone would construct this for humans to be held in. It's absolutely vile. It has this eerie quality about it, which is very, very difficult for me to describe. You could see why the Afghan people were so terrified of this prison facility. These are the exercise yards. The Afghans who lived around here and throughout the country really thought that if they ended up in here, they would never, ever get out. And some people spent years here. OK, let's go down and see the... Um... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to end up with a broken leg. There's still there's plenty of hospital equipment left behind that you can patch me up with. <laughs> What a horrible, horrible place. And it was like someone had led a trail of breadcrumbs of evidence and we followed it all right into the heart of this detention centre and found the storeroom packed full of the sort of paraphernalia of prison and torture. What is wrong with these people? This is what they, when they first arrived, this is what they were given, wasn't it? Soap, <laughs> given cable ties, there's, there's toothpaste. It was initially built and run by the Americans. Then they claimed they handed it over to Afghan control, but they, the Americans were still there, pretty much up until they upped and left suddenly. The smell is quite extraordinary, and in each of these cells, there's no windows, and you can completely block out all light with these two panels. Oh, my God. No wonder it smells. I mean, we all went round that whole facility pretty much whispering to each other, because it felt like it, there were all these... Well, to me, there were all these ghosts there. Mm. Again. These are the creepiest things in this whole place. It's a pretty creepy place. Blackout goggles. So that's basically to, to deprive you of sight. That's sensory deprivation. Alongside it, there was loads of earmuffs that you could use to deprive people of, of sound and noise. Those are the classic tools used in interrogation, in abuse, in the whole gamut of horrors that you know have happened in this place. It wasn't so much what you were seeing in Bagram, it was what you were feeling. The place just emanated something. And suddenly we heard noises upstairs. I can hear people. You've got to realise, none of the Taliban knew we were there. We walk upstairs and come face to face with a group of really shocked and visibly upset young Taliban fighters. I wondered why he was looking at me in a funny way. Here's a bunch of people that they may well associate with the suffering that they see and have felt in, the, in this place. We didn't get a reaction that I expected at all. In fact, you know, they were pretty open with us, very willing to share their experience. They spontaneously crouched down and started praying. <laughs> Many of these hardened Taliban fighters were crying. And then when they came out after the praying, they were angry, really angry, and very emotional. Do you think there'll be more suicide bombers because of what happened here? I think you would have to be superhuman to emerge from an experience like that and not absolutely hate the system, the people, the country who put you in there. We like to think of, you know, the way we behave in war as 
right and wrong, good and bad, good guys, bad guys. But actually what Bagram showed me was that that's just not the case. And actually the reality is far more blurred than that and much, much more complicated than we like to think. Leaving was always going to be complicated. The Tolkien border was not an option anymore. There'd been too many security alerts around it. Uh, our only option at this point was to go out with the Qataris who were organizing sort of repatriation flights. When we arrived, there was a crowd of people. There were a lot of people who were holding up British passports, American passports. They were green card holders, all trying to beg the Qatari officials to let them in to get on board a flight out of Afghanistan. Australian! Anyone from Australia? Excuse me, sir. Yes. Who you're taking and who you're not taking. It's very simple. How they before, how they before coming here by passport? Who had valid passport, not expire? Who had visa? That's it. He can live. That veneer of control that the Taliban had was starting to unravel a little bit. So they weren't particularly pleased when we started to film the situation that they were failing to control very well, or that we were showing how many people genuinely wanted to leave and get out of the country. Hey, stop, no, 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 stop. Hey, 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 no, no, stop, stop. No, hey, hey, hey. Fixer got a bit excited and pushing and shoving ensued and suddenly you're realizing, ooh, you're sort of this close from sort of having fisticuffs with the Taliban and you're thinking, well, 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 this, isn't, this isn't good. Please, stop, stop. yeah, stop, please. There's no need for this. Yeah, don't let him take it away. Is it a, yeah, go with Pfizer. Yeah, I'm not sure, don't worry, chill. It was giving you a sense of the general direction of travel of, in, of interactions with the Taliban. What's he saying, Faisal? He said, like, if you film again, I will make you guys, like, I will break everything and uh, I will make you guys break. Right. They, they're very, very anxious about us not filming and all these people are lining outside, just desperate to get out. Many of them have been waiting for many weeks, up to a month, they tell us. I think we all left genuinely concerned about the future of Afghanistan. I don't think any of us see it um, flourishing in the near future. It was very trying, it was very tiring. It was very sad, it was very scary at times. We thought the last 20 years was quite eventful. I think the next 20 years might even eclipse it. There's going to be so much going on because Afghanistan is still quite instrumental geographically in that area. The fundamental grassroots hardcore Taliban from the countryside, they ain't changing nothing. Girls should not go to school. Um, women shouldn't really work unless it's in hospitals, and many of them are fundamentally conservative and it's super right-wing. Uh, there's some real evil, nasty people there. The whole story of Afghanistan is definitely, definitely not over, and I think that we'll be spending a lot of time there in the future. Next time on Hotspots, yeah. we're in paradise. We're in Namibia, where plans to drill for oil are threatening some of the world's most precious and endangered wildlife. We don't know what the effect of that oil and our environment. We are afraid for that. And over a decade since an earthquake ravaged Haiti, 
we revisit to find a country on a knife edge. The atmosphere was really tense. Those of bullets being fired. They're trying to clear the street. Until then, you can find us on Twitter at Alex Crawford Sky and at Ramsey Sky. See you next time. Come as you are, as you were, as I want you to be, as a friend, as a friend, as an old.